I'll, I'll just start it again. Okay. Well, many of these kids, I think, are teenagers now, but I see drugs, alcohol being a big issue, and I wonder if is their growth stopping? Will they be losing 50 years of their I'm, lives? I'm hoping not. I talked with my nephews and I had a bunch of them sitting around with me and I was talking to them about my youth. I said, I can't tell you guys what to do, but I'm going to talk to you about what I did. You know, my drinking, my drugs, and the things that happened, and the choices I made. The Creator gave us many great gifts. Great gifts. All of this around us is Creator through our Mother Earth to us to sustain our lifestyle here. And, and uh, I made choices as a young man that were real detrimental to my health and well-being. You know, I kind of ended up in jail and, and a lot of bad things. And I look back on it, probably 90% of the uh, problems that I had in my life were alcohol and drug related. So now I'm trying to sober side of my life the last four or almost five years now. And I'm having a lot more fun. You know, I mean, I, I can see more clearly now. And yeah. One of those times where I wish I could go back to get ahead, time machine type, more now. But uh, I'm telling the guys, you know, I say, you know, I know you guys are going to probably try this and that. Don't get stuck there. It's a waste of time. You're not having as much fun as you think you are. What fun is it to? Suck this big ball down and you don't know what you did last night and you're hearing these stories from other friends that want to elaborate on it. But, and you're walking around to walk of shame the next day because you don't know what happened. <laughs> you know, I mean, geez, you don't get a bike and you're bothering somebody. Or, but I like this idea of being able to make intelligent, uh, I was kind of intelligent thoughts, you know, without, without, uh, Impairing them with drugs and alcohol. It's, uh, well, I guess I can dream and see a little clearer now without all the impediments or whatever. So, right now, I, I would just say, with you know, if you're going to try it, don't get stuck there. I'd rather they didn't try it. But there's a lot of life out there, and again, education with the key. To me, I, I keep encouraging my children. And, Whoever I go to school, learn all the Haida you can. You can learn everything you can about Haida, but make sure you got that education as well. They can't take it away from you. you know, my kids all went to school. I, I unfortunately quit in my end of my junior year. I didn't go back to school until I was 37 years old. I got my GED when I was 37. Went to college for a couple of years. Some of the more funner moments in my life when I went back to school. I hated school when I was a younger guy. Now I'm 37 years old, went back to Native American studies. I had so much fun learning, learning how to learn. As an experience. Learning how to learn, yeah. You know, that was uh, kind of opened a lot of doors in a, in a short period of time. I think. Wow, I wish I would have done this year on this year. New rule was sucking things up a little better. Because you know? I was pretty sauced up by then. I wasn't taking in the knowledge as easy as it would have been when I was a younger. But some of it got in there and retained. It seemed like the more I studied about Native American studies, the angrier I got. What they did to our people, and again, I'm talking about the historical trauma. I was involved in all this treatment and kind of put a, a shame barrier there about being native. Now we're taking that cloak away slow but sure. I'm getting to be, hopefully, to put my kindness up, I'll do oh, I'll lose the status of a lawyer. And now, like I said, uh, I keep reiterating that. Uh, don't cry for me, cry for a little boy inside of me. You cry, teach me to be Haida. Well, the Haida Warriors basketball team won regionals, and the big celebration oh, is tonight. Yeah, yeah. And that's, or, you know, I'm very the, proud Jim. of him. I talked to the coach last night, you know, and he's a young guy in his first year, and he said, 
all their flowery of science and what's on how to do that stuff. But he took them to state. I mean, he's going to state with this young team. I'm real proud of all of them, and this is a step in the right direction. You know, I'm a warrior, uh, that type of attitude, and hearing about their traveling from other villages and other places such as Grace, on how our, our children are walking, high dignity, and behaving on these trips. And it does my heart good knowing that they're being good representatives of But they don't say, what's his name acted like that? What's her name acted like that? They say, see how those hyenas act? Yeah. That's what they would say if they did something bad. It's real easy to uh, condemn people when they do things bad. Why is it so hard to throw out a compliment when they do something good? Yeah, you did good. We need to put as much energy into praising as we do and cutting down. Maybe even a lot less cutting down. You know? I hear the basketball team walked with honor and everyone was very proud that they were very well behaved. That was stated at the school board meeting and uh, the whole village is proud. Yeah, I, I, I'm proud. I've heard that myself. I have several nephews on there. And, uh, it makes me feel good that they're representing us well, being respectful of themselves and other people. And they go out, like I said earlier, they're not going to say those high of the warrior. Those high up people. How you get grouped in. I'm glad we have the representatives in our youth. I'm real proud of them. I can't say that enough. I will be at that dinner tonight. I hope there's some singing and dancing. Yeah, me too. I kind of anticipate it. I know how I feel. I would talk to my son and the rest of the warrior. Hey, old warrior. Let's give our young bucks a little pep talk here. Get down. Put that drum beat there. The drum beat is considered the heartbeat of our mother earth. Many tribes consider it the heartbeat of our mother earth. So, uh, the drums are held in high Bart and I have talked about having some drum beats on the internet live and having people in other locations join in with their drums and that with the internet we could have people all around the world drumming together at the same time and every week every time we do that we get more and more people drumming from Hawaii, from Micronesia, from all tribes that would be wonderful to, to see that happen, get everyone w to beat with the same heart. I can hear that. Drums around the world. We had one like that several years ago on Seattle, and they had that, uh, the condor and the meeting of the eagle and the condor. They were going from South America to North America. They are coming together on their meeting in Seattle. Supposedly at that same moment there's groups of people all over the world. I was in Guatemala with young commissioners of 12 nations, all indigenous, uh, and that was a, a meeting of the eagle and the condor. Lone eagle and condors from 12 different countries, and it was all about the internet, how to get people connected, and how to use it for indigenous voice and indigenous empowerment. Oh, yeah. Nice. That was 10 years ago, though. Not enough has happened, but we are getting the connectivity, whether or not we're all beating the same drum with the same vision of one human family. That, that is yet to come, I think. But once we get connected, then it opens the door for us all to be able to uh, sing and dance together, ideally. I like that. Uh, I start telling the story. I tell the stories for last year. There's a group of people that are real strong uh, people, I guess. And uh, I'm talking to them about the government stuff and how they're treating the assimilation process. And some of the terms and things that we went through, and the hurt, you could see the hurt in the people. Some of them are getting mad. Why do you keep bringing up this old stuff? It's over with. Well, it's not over with us, it still hurts here. I, mean, I, I didn't learn how to be a parent when I raised, I got six children. I wasn't a very good parent to them. I didn't learn how to be a parent. 
I was in a boarding school. There was one, uh, one guidance counselor for 200 guys. So we don't have a father, or mother, or uncle, or somebody saying, you act like this here for other people. We just have to kind of shift for ourselves. And, and, uh, so we lost that mothering and fathering skills. We lost the parenting skills, whole generations of people. So it was more like children having children. We didn't have the skills to raise children the way they were supposed to be. Now we're learning from that, but again, the trauma that was set into our passing now, probably through the three, four generations, and it's still affecting our people. You know, so we've got some, uh, a lot of in depth stuff on myself and other people to keep track of. Again, it'll never be gone, but we've got to do the best of what we've got. Stepping back into our own footsteps, our own culture. But, you know, I mean, I, I could see it when uh, we go to a doing to respect values. When I was a kid, we walked into a big doing, there's 500 people there, coming to raise a stick. You could hear the pin drop in the room. Quiet, everybody is really respectful in that manner. We're going to pay respect to whoever is speaking, listen to what they have to share with us. Now you go to a doing, ah, it's pretty loud. And half of them are going to have a phone ringing and all these other things are going off there and they're not paying attention to them. So again, some of these little values like respecting each other and speaking and, and uh, respect was one thing. I think there was one of the bigger things in our higher values is respect. Love, yeah, love of each other and respect for all things. Everything has a spirit. The fish. I got a lot of fish, not because I'm such a good fisherman, but because I was living in a good manner. So they gave themselves to me. I didn't get that here because I was such a good hunter. I was living in a good manner for the Spirit to offer them to me. And I went to thank them. I would say a prayer and I would explain to them. And their flesh is going to help me to sustain my life and my family. How I for offering yourself. Every, every, or the berry. Before I ate them, I would have to give them the same reverence as that deer. Or all of these things help me sustain my life. So I need to, to, to say my prayer. And remember to say my prayer and thank the Creator for giving me these things. We're all trying to get back to that timeless wisdom of being one with everything around us. And a part of that is respect and humility, as you say. That's a big thing, learning to get along with each other. I think that, uh, boy, that almighty dollar gets in the way of a lot of people's things. You start out with good value system and saying, oh, this, this, yeah. this, that. Yeah. Then a big buck gets in the way and forget about the trees. Wipe them down, they're worth money. Forget about the fish. But the long-term and sustainable whale that we handle it through the year, we only take what we need. It's not going to hurt this creek or the forest or yeah. these things that are going to help us carry on through our life. And my next generation, next generation. Again, when we made decisions before, we talked about that seven generation earlier. When our people sat down before, they didn't make a decision that was going to affect me and you today, right now. They were making decisions for seven generations down the road, so they were sitting there thinking long term. Oh. So 10,000 years or more sustained the environment, sustained culture exactly. through mutual support and respect of the environment, and now we're struggling to get back to that. And I, and I like that where you mentioned it, and I, told, I wrote this letter to my son about being the seventh generation. My feeling is only a personal thought. That you and your age group are the seventh generation. And according to the prophecy, you guys are going to take this veil off, so to speak, and bring a lot of what we lost back. I got great hope. We're doing a good job. God, we got good leadership. 
we got good upcoming leaders in, in uh, on that. a lot of these young people and all I don't hesitate to tell them either. Yeah. Real proud of them. You, you had four girls from the village in Washington, D.C. They raised their own money. They were at the National Council of American Indians Conference with the senators and uh, congresspersons from Alaska. They were on national TV and interviewed. And, and now they're doing a PowerPoint to put up on the Internet to tell the story of how they are young leaders and they took the initiative to make this happen. And I've just spent two weeks with them. Awesome. Doing digital storytelling so that they can uh, take height of values all around the world through the internet. Another thing we were looking into, like repatriation, not only of our artifacts that are out there in all these museums throughout the world. Again, I keep repatriate our feelings, our values, and the value system to me is the most important thing. It's really, respect. really sensitive. And learning how to be it's human really beings again. We get so tied up in our personal gratification, it gets, it gets we forget that we have kid. children, grandchildren, I'm tied up in what I need for the day. Do I need another pill? Do I need a drink? Do I need another hamburger? Hey, wait a minute, I got a child over asking me to go for a walk when I'm too busy going down here to. I have a beer with my buddy. Choices, again. Choices, yeah. The Creator gave us many important gifts, all these things that help. But to me, one of the most important gifts He gave us was the gift of choice. And we are at where are we at because of the choices that we made, I made. I went to jail, I did this, I did this. Not because of what you did, you did this. I made a choice. I got to quit blaming everybody, our people would say, who day? When you're sitting there blaming other people about the misery that you're in, and you're wallowing in your self-pity, look how many you got pointing back at yourself. We'll be pointing over there. Take care of yourself. You made a choice, you got your ass where you're Do something about it. I found, I found a phrase on the internet, I put it uh, on, on my, every email I send I have this phrase and it says, your life is a gift from the Creator, what you do with it is your gift back to the Creator. I try to live by that and share that. You and I must read a lot of the same thing, I got that written on a card, I was just looking at it last night, it's one of my, uh, well I like a lot of different quotes and yeah. if, I, if I like them I'll write them down and that was I was just looking at that one. Right? That's a good one. It's one to it. take serious, yeah. isn't it? I wrote it to one of my friends who was having a really hard time and I put that at the end of my letter for, hey, you know, what to get back is no. choices, like you say. Yeah. But they're probably uh Trying to call me, I'm supposed to go fishing today, but uh, I thought this was pretty important too. I want not just my voice or face to be on the world, but the idea of what we're going through and what we need to do to uh, take a step forward to go ahead. Again, this is looking back, get ahead type of a deal. We need those values. We want these values. And, and uh, stuff like this is going to help us. And, Letting other people know that we're here in a while and they'll come and like in the last few years just having this year we see more tourist type people and more. Before we didn't want them here because well, we got outsiders interloping into our country. Now we're saying, oh please come. We got a whole bunch of paddles we could sell you. We got a whole bunch of drums. We got a whole bunch of stories. We want to let the world know who we are again and we're getting well. Maybe people will come, there will be new canoes and you can take them on canoe trips. I, I'm hoping so. In my lifetime I want to see that. You know, I've I'm I'm, I'm probably only got about 40, 50 more years and I'll be an old guy. <laughs> <laughs> my father's 93. Yeah. You know, That's good. Could, yeah. could be another 30 years plus. Yeah. I'm 64. Guy. I remember my father was in my place. I had a home in Seattle and I came to visit him on his birthday. Yeah. And his partner was visiting him with some guy.
get along good. He ate fish every day of his life. His name is Bob Morrison. My father is Sylvester Peel. They're sitting at my house and I'm feeding them fish and rice. I said, I like to eat. So, uh, Cloud and dad's friend said, How old are you, yeah. Sylvester? Fish and rice. My dad said, 73. Oh, you're just a young guy. Well, his partner was 93. Uh, and they both got along. They both uh -huh. digging clams and they're yeah, all their uh -huh. I like what you said about your learning from the young people about Haida culture. Uh -huh. Hey, somewhere again, the boarding school. Just, these young kids uh, were exposed to a lot of it here. You know, start coming out of the closet and dancing, start coming back. Yeah. For a spelder, it wasn't. It's good boiler. It wasn't too much. Like it. An elder in Mitlakatla said. Uh, Janet Guthrie, right. you might know her. Yeah. She said, potlatch is coming back. And uh, we've been talking about virtual potlatch. What would that be like to volunteer and give culture through the internet all around the world? Virtual potlatch. Well, if they've seen all the fun we're having there, they probably come too, you know? And, and all these things, I think potlatch came from that sailor's word, to give. To give. Poulash is actually what the actual word, poulash. And in those potlatches, they were outlawed because of the, the economic system that went. I think our, uh, most of our tribes were like a mild form of uh, communism, maybe, you know, like everything was communally shared. And I thought it was a pretty good system because, you know, I didn't, whatever I got, I, I would go feed the elders first and single ladies with kids, they get first of the food, whatever it is. By the time I get through town, I better, might be lucky to have enough for dinner. That? But that's the way it should be, and that's the way it is now. I know there's yeah. still a few of us that got that. Like yesterday, the day before, we got a bunch of helmet out there. We spent the whole day yesterday cleaning it up and giving it to all the elders and into the elder food program. Probably show up at the basketball celebration tonight, huh? A lot of it. Yeah. We gave them a lot of help and a lot of shrimp to yeah. uh, help celebrate the same year. So. Well, you talk about the giving culture versus the Great White Way and the taking culture. Taking culture. That was a big, big difference. And it was uh, a giving thing was a, a big part of the culture. You know, we're always sharing things, food. You walk in, even still today, we lost a lot of that feeling, but Heidelberg is real good about that. If you walked around to visit most people in the town, walk there and oh, come on in, have some coffee, or they're going to try to feed you right away. Sit down and get to know you, you know. And then one of the words is, okay, you got a coffee and sandwich, you're no longer a guest. If you come to town, you got to come and help yourself. <laughs> so I try to be pretty uh, uh, open. Yeah. Again, we never used to lock our doors before that when the road was not connected here. People, you leave your boat motor, your gas, and all the stuff they come back. Nobody bothered us. Now we're all connected up and we're all got all modernized. We've got to lock our houses and lock it. Lock up the heart. Lock up the heart, huh? Lock us up. They exposed us and lock us up. The modern age. <laughs> But I think we could thrive in both worlds. You know, we got really intelligent people here. We just need to keep up with the modern things and adapt it into our, our lifestyle. Yeah, just like we've, done, just like we've done all these years. <laughs> Only we got to quit wallowing <laughs> ourselves self pity and say, you know, get stuck in the ground and using these other things as excuses to stay there. Huh? Put these things away, it's a choice, it's a person choice. Which two boys? Come and do these things. Go cook with them. Or go chop wood for your auntie, your uncle. Go big clams. Go do something. Don't have to lay by that TV all day. Good choices, good values. What you put out there comes back in good ways. I don't like it when our people sit there and yawning around. Oh, I'm bored. There's nothing to do. Oh, I got a good book you could read. Or, oh, I got some wood you could chop. There's a million things here you can do. You don't have to sit up at home every day. Yeah, a box rice is going to help. Well, you don't have to go earn money and uh, 
you charging your uncle a chop wood? What's the matter with you? <laughs> Going down there to do it just doesn't need to be done. Yeah. So we need to, you know, we see a lot of the new generations, I think we call them like the entitled generation. Spoiled children? Kind of. Yes, I was trying to use nice words, but uh, yeah. You know, we hand them, you want to go to the store? It's common to see them, oh, 10, 20 bucks. No. Did they do a chore for that today? They have to garbage the shop with. You don't see too many young people doing that in the right now, you know. Entitled to this $400 phone on the iPad and all these other fancy of toys that cost for fortune. But uh, we need to put a value system on this. How did you earn that? Did you do chore to come on, Dad? Did you go chop to not do it? Did you go clean your own? We need to put teaching and working values to school. We can't just teach anything. Like yep. An elder on the Yukon said, don't give those kids nothing. Make them work for it. And he winked with a smile because he knows that self-value comes when you put forth effort. And many of these big native corporations, they, they give lots of money to kids and they don't give them anything to create self-value. And, and I think that's a bad investment. Kids need to value their contribution to the community, to the culture, and to the whole world. These kids are very special as the seventh generation. I don't think they believe me when I say that. Yeah. Well, I, th I think uh, we need to keep repeating it until they believe us, to see their own value. We need to keep reinstilling to them that they're walking, oh, you're a good kid. Oh, you're a beautiful, oh, you're a smart kid, oh, you're one of all. I like it when you try hard. I'll keep giving them this positive affirmation. Oh, you're good. Oh, you're good. Oh, you're good. Oh, you're good. We tell people they're bad. I mean, we've been told we're bad people for 500 years. We need to change that around now. Yep, I, I hear the tug of war between positive thinking and negative thinking. Yeah. And certainly, Haida culture over 10,000 years did not survive because people put each other down and were negative. And yeah. I, I see it coming around. You know, your son Tony said uh, when he sees kids on the street with their heads down that slept in all morning for doing bad things all night long, he says, I, I try to t be positive and tell them and encourage them. So I was trying to invite him over here because he's more articulate with words than I am. Oh, you he's, are very he's, articulate. He's, uh, he's got an education where I kind of yeah. let, let it slide a little bit. I had the pleasure to talk to him for a half hour over at the school and also his daughter has uh, been learning digital storytelling and we have her reading the Haida Constitution on the internet now. Really? Uh, just from the other day, yeah. And she's a, a wonderful gal. She yeah. has great Great potential, smart so kid. smart. Yeah, he's a smart kid. Yeah. I got uh, five daughters and one son. I got two living in Seattle, a couple living there. My one daughter, she's worked on the store here. Okay, brother. Hold on. Well, it's raining like crazy. I don't know if you go fishing in the rain, do you? Well, my captain didn't call. Well, I've heard that smartphone in your pocket yeah. trying to whistle yeah. for your attention. Well, we had some uh, shrimp gear out here. I've been fishing for the tribe, putting away stuff for the culture camp and for the hours. Well, I go out with them and help out. Tony brought me some bags of shrimp. I have some for lunch over at the school. All right. I've on. never had shrimp like that. Oh, oh, wonderful. Right. So good. And uh, I'm looking at maybe coming back in culture camp with my video camera. I hope and you do. You'll see a lot of good... Uh, James will have six canoes done by then, huh? Yeah. yeah. I started a few masks. That's my corner over there. They kind of cluttered it up. But I started a couple of masks and uh, I got all kinds of projects. I get tired of them or get a bad Do you off. sell your masks and drums? Are the, is there anything for sale in the village? I've not seen anything. Gene said he has many pictures, and uh, but the things are at his house, not where you can buy them. I got them. smaller paddle at my house that's painted up and done. Probably a couple hundred dollar paddle. 
I'd like to buy a drum. I haven't seen any for sale. I got three drums in my house. They're not painted right now. If you have, if you, what kind of a design would you like on it? Well, I'm from Eagle Clan. Eagle Clan. That, now we can get an eagle on a drum for you. Yeah. Yeah. I got three drums at my house. Maybe we can stop by and have a look at them. And keep it going off and keep it going on for you. Well, I'm heading out tomorrow. But uh, we, we, could, we could sure talk about that. You yeah. could... Paint, paint one up, I send you a check, you send me the drum. Yeah, I'm just show you the picture and you're satisfied it. Yeah. If not, there's a lot of eagles around. You know. That'd be great. You bet. we got to put all these crafts up on the internet so kids come and are making lots of things to, to sell, to get the height of culture uh, in, you know, all around the world. That's doable. With I'm, the internet, I'm, it is doable. I am all for that. You know, I, I uh, really want to share again with you and the world on what's going on here. Maybe there's somebody out there that can come and lend a hand. I was telling you stories like I was telling you earlier about the assimilation process and how the troops and government affected our people and the residual effects, negative effects. And as we're walking out of here, just walk, walked them out and we sang a goodbye song. And one of the guys, he's an older guy, he's an old preacher. He walked up to me and he has tears in his eyes and he looked at me and he said, I'm sorry. What? I'm sorry for what my ancestors did to your people. I, I, I never realized until I heard the story from you on how deep and badly it was. And I just start thinking about it and I want to apologize for my people. And I looked down and gave him a hug and I stood back and said, what? I said, that's one. I said, one what? I said, for 10 years I've been crying the same story. You're the first one that apologized. That's one. He said, is there anything I could do? I said, you just started. Yeah. And the very next day we're sitting out there and the news came on and we're sitting there listening. Hope apologizes to Native America for a bad wrong reason. Yes! It's starting. It is starting, yes. So, you know, the church is admitting that they did wrong and, and the way they treated our people by, you know, we were, before any preacher or any church set foot on Native America, we were already living that way. Already reverent, we one with the environment. Of a so called Christian life than the Christians were living themselves. They imposed it when they first studying our people. They kept saying, oh, this is wrong, this is wrong, this is wrong. And when they looked at our people and how we were living with reverence and respect for everything, you guys had more right than we did, so to speak. You know, we were paying attention to it. Every day we were talking to our Creator and thanking our Mother and giving reverence to everything. You understood you're a part of everything, whereas m most other religions think they are separate from everything. As I started studying the book, because I wanted to be a, a buyer by the rules, and I started thinking, and deeper I got into the Bible and reading the Bible and reading the instructions, and all this much, it's all poetry, and it's kind of, and it took interpretation to me. I'm thinking, what's going on here? How come that group split off because they were mad about these guys interpreting? These guys are all on church, not all breaking up because they're reading the book and they're all interpreting different things. Now they're trying to sell me this book of goods and this one thing, one of them. Why are you interpreting it this way? Starting a war over this year, rule here, and it says in this book here, you're really confusing the crap out of me, guys. You guys are fighting amongst each other for 2,500 years and you want me to join this? You guys got a bad club there, man. I'm not buying into this. You guys are telling lies to each other, you're not following your own rules. I'm having a real hard time with this. Can we go back to where we were? Can we get our own rules and regulations? Oh, we'll abide by yours. Oh. Let us live our Christianity own. is 2,000 years old. How old is the height of belief? Tens of, tens of thousands, yes. And the further they look back, and they talk about the land bridge even, and the further they go back, <coughs> like they were saying, eight, ten, thousand, twelve thousand years ago, our people came back on the land bridge. Oh, how come they're finding artifacts of ours that date back thirty-five thousand years? 
And they don't want to publicize that because it blows the theory out of their land <laughs> Oh, it even messes with the Bible theory. Oh, we can't go back that far. But we still want our story to be told. We won't be here a long time. You know, our spirits are still with us. We do that strong. You know, <clears throat> I'm going to teach you how to you know. At night when the spirits are, when you're at sleep in your home, our spirits are home. This is our home. We don't just pack up our things and leave our people buried here, you know. We don't walk away from this land of reverence to us. We put our people away from our ancestors. So this is our, we're laying in our mother. This is our blood. I imagine the ancestors standing in the trees watching the youth, the seventh generation, as they learn a little bit about this technology. Maybe they're, it's MTV, maybe it's smartphones, maybe it's an iPad, but at the same time they're learning Haida language and learning to have a global voice and to capture elders' stories like you've been sharing today. And I have, I have high hopes for this generation to lead a new day of cultural sovereignty. I, I'm with you on that thought, and, and Gail, you know, I look at what's happening here, like this building and the longhouse that's coming up, and the youth that are getting the education up here, and everybody's getting involved in little pieces, and, and that's what it takes, one little piece at a time. It's going to build it bigger and bigger and bigger, you know, thing, and it's, just, it's starting a snowball effect, I think, you know, it's, before it was kind of just a few people doing things. Now I even got my brother down there, yeah. steady, you know. And slowly, different people are filtering into the use this building. Like the first time, a couple of years old, but it got busy in a hurry. Well, you know, Bart has this vision of a Haida Global Academy where we could teach Haida values online. Mm -hmm. And he says where he's from in Micronesia, people are hungry to learn, and they're just getting the internet. And for them to learn and then turn around and teach Haida values, uh, it, it, it could change the world. The world needs some changing. Well, that's where I was at. I'm learning how to learn. And when I learn how to do that, maybe I could share that with some of my kids, you know, or, or other people, or maybe be a positive influence in some way. Again, like I said, I went back to school when I was three, seven years old. Yeah. Had a couple of years of education and opened a lot of beer doors and I did a lot of activist work when I was living in Washington, you know, fighting against the, uh, well, the way they were logging. I'm not against the logging totally. The way they were doing it, the strip logging was wiping out creeks and making the forest look bad, and causing a lot of erosion problems. Right. Then the fish farming. Well, when I was at the dance group, I got involved with it. Well, we go around dancing, we sing to a lot of people, hundreds, thousands of people out there. Why don't we carry a message? Well, it's not about a song and a dance. This is about a way of life. We need to tell them about the trees. We need help from all these people. We need to tell them what they're doing to the fish. We need to tell them, we need to tell them. Look at our brothers and sisters in the void that don't have a voice. The deer, the bear fish. You don't understand them. You don't understand them. I have to speak for them. Look what you're doing to my brothers and sisters home. Why do you do this? You're doing it to yourself. What happens to the beast happens to the man. So we got to take care of them. We are all related. We're all related. <laughs> That's the way it is, too. So, again, there's the circle thing. We take care of those. Not one better than the other, just a part of the circle. You know, I'm not better than that deer. I'm not better than that slug. I'm not better than that eagle. I am only a part of this whole thing. Right now. The Creator made us to take care of each other. Well, I think it's so significant that Haida feel they are part of everything. Whereas so many people around the world feel they are separate from everything. And wh what a big difference that must be to feel inside that, you know, you, you are a part of everything. The, the sky, the water, the earth, the animals, the birds. 
It's uh, all of that is me. All of this is our beliefs. To see yourself and everything around you is a gift that you can give to the world, as my hope. That's my hope too. Even though you know we're we're struggling for to, to find ways to do these things, and I think we're just falling in place right now. We've got again a lot of young people with the same dream: save our culture, save us, save our culture, save us. And I believe that's I have a lot of time to sit and think about it. To reinstill this culture is going to save our people. You know, to be able to walk up to my brother and speak high up to him. And I know how I said, God, too old to learn. To no, he's down here making bedwood boxes now, something he didn't do a couple months ago. So he's doing a whole new thing here and checking up where he is. Kind of jealous he's got more boxes than me. But he's probably going to donate one to me because he's my brother. I, I, was at a, we drop in. <laughs> I was at an elders conference and an elder said after my presentation on preserving elders stories digitally, they said, uh, thank you for keeping your presentation short. The elders don't want to hear about something they know nothing about. And then we watched videos about meth and drugs and everyone was depressed. And I've thought back to that many times and I like what you said that you're learning about your culture from the young people, and you're learning to learn. And I deal with seniors. I'm very interested in how seniors can get on the internet and be inspired, yeah. and and you know to to leverage and share their wisdom of their lifetimes. I, I think that's real important that we can step back. Especially, we've got some people here that are you know, really old now, that no relationship, family relationships, and how how we were brought together and why he did things in a certain manner, why did he eat this, why did he use this. We had a lot of medicines that we lost, touch with, you know. And that was one important thing. I, I know there was a little bit of a wrong when I was young today, but I think that was one big thing the government did right away. They took all the medicine and they were the leaders of the community. And they made it sound like medicine man evil medicine man, witch doctor, these kind of things were attached to these type of people. They were doctors. They it, were healers. They knew which plants were good medicines and was, yeah. much of that knowledge was lost. Yeah. A lot of that was lost. And they tried to teach some young some of us I think. But most of us were God, they introduced the T V to help us. I think what we were about we were teenagers when they got it up to yeah. There was no TV or phone here when we were in grade school. And it seems like the, the lifestyle changed a lot. I look, when we were young kids in grade school here, we played games, a lot of running games, dime tags, steel the flag, basketball, puzzle, blah, blah, blah. Made boats, carved things, did the, uh, we made our own play. We made our own game. Now you walk around at that same age group, Yes, some of the Good. teachers were saying, why don't we have any games? Get the kids outside. There, there's, there's such a thing as too much digital technology. Yeah. It's, it needs to be a balance. It needs to be used wisely, not, not to dominate their lives. And taking but, away from the, even the physical, not just the mental, but the physical. Instead of going out for a walk, they're sitting there. You hear a lot of people. Go on out and play, jeez. You know, you can't even get the kids out of the house anymore. So, yeah, there needs to be some kind of balance. And that, again, those rules need to be set by our... By our well, you can have that if you're done with your homework. Or have you taken out the garbage? Or have you... We need to set some... Yeah. Set things up to make them good things, to earn them. Get them out of that entitled feeling put some work ethics back into ourselves and to them. Yeah, at the Coeur d'Alene tribe they have a community center and up on the wall it says natives have always worked for a living. And so, well, yeah. yeah, but many of the young kids haven't really been asked to work and haven't learned the self-esteem that comes from doing good work and building things and contributing. It's a little short every day I feel better if I get up in the morning and go do something, go some chop somebody's wood. 
go catch a fish, go share something. You feel way better after it's done. Gives meaning to the day. I remember when I was a young guy, too, when we were young kids. I know in our house, on Saturday, if I woke up early in the morning uh, and did a chore, got up and piled wood or went to see my uncle or auntie or one of the chinas and ran on there and chopped their wood for them, bring in some kingling or something, maybe take an hour out of my morning, then I'm good for the day. But if I sat around and I got nothing to do and I'm being bored, Dad find a chore for you. Now you got to work all day. So it's easier to think of a chore or go out and do something for somebody else before they made you do something. I mean, you really come back to work. Yeah. <laughs> got in the habit of, oh, I'm going to go back wood for tonight. Oh, and I almost always had cake or a muffin or a hot chocolate. So you do a chore for them, they treated you. They're all going and go to hard candy, I do. Yeah. Well, there are different ones I think you go through different families, you know. You don't see too much of that anymore. Too many young people right out there. What's a typical southeast? What's that? Typical southeast. Please. Typical southeast. I was wondering if the the spirits are agreeing with you. Yes. That <laughs> Calling up the southeast when they're calling the uh, master carpenter. Probably what I didn't go today too. I was coming up with the captain to see how many people are supposed to be in Los Angeles. I'm not leaving before 9.30. Did I come? Because uh, I don't want to have some stories from my priorities around the community. Yeah, new priorities. Choices. Again, the choices and the priorities and how we make those, it's, that's uh, where I'm at on a personal level. I'd like to take my life and try to make something positive out of it. I'm 61, be 62 in a couple of months. And, and just to show myself that we can go from, like I said, I wallowed around in a bottle for 40 years. A lot of drugs, a lot of alcohol, a lot of stuff like that. But what am I doing to myself? You know? And then, uh, you know, I don't want to bring shame to me, to my family, to my children. To my, do I want my grandkids growing up? Uh, ooh, no, that's good. Oh, hey, that's my chanel. And I want them to be able to call them uh, somewhere or something. Well, will find something to do. A few kids will be messing around. But I share a lot of songs, I share a lot of stories. I figured that uh, small part of who we are. I'm trying to go back to where I read a lot to try to find the stories and, and the history of our people. I want to share as much as I can. It was real amazing to me. We had a church over here last year and I was telling stories about our effective church and government on our people. And there's an older couple sitting in this uh, here and he got up and talked to me after and here he was involved in this uh, church that was built across the bridge over there. And we were teenagers, young young men at the time, and we didn't want nothing to do with another church in our village. One church was enough, they treated us pretty bad. What do we want another one for? They were fighting against each other, they're making us fight against each other. Everybody's interpretation getting excited around here. Let's so we tried to keep that church out here. We even tried, when he got up the building, we even tried to burn the thing down. Ah, no kidding. I mean, it was that bad. It was a big fight. Oh, yeah. was, we were fighting to, that we didn't want our people to He came in here and he was literally going around to our older people and telling them to burn their blankets, burn the drums, and burn all the artifacts. It's all evil stuff. And we heard about it and all we're, we're getting young men. Wait a minute, this is our family, everyone's, and we've got to protect you, you know, and some of them, a lot of it was actually taken away and full. I mean, I got some good bucks out of it. We need, again, we patriate some of these things that were once ours so we can look at it and get ideas on how they did it, and then go further. I understand there's a Heide, Heide Museum in Germany. I hear they got one of the biggest, most part, most of our stuff <coughs> over there. Yeah. We ought to talk to those guys. Yeah. Me too. <clears throat>
but uh, we, I started when I was working in Seattle, I started to repatriate the committee there. And we started tracing down a lot of our stuff in all these museums around there. And then I took an a idea from uh, Hyde of Y people and I joined a partnership with them and they had already gone through the process. So, well, you guys must have a list. They had a list of what a lot of our stuff was. So it would be real easy for our community to step into their community. Go borrow their information and go start collecting our stuff. And if along through, we need a museum. We need to train somebody that can be a curator and learn how to do this preservation stuff. Again, bringing home our culture. The Smithsonian of, uh, Museum of the Native American has talked about creating virtual museums for every tribe to where it could be online on the internet and people could see it from all over the world, but also uh, to, to have a physical museum here where people could come and, and visit. And there's a native museum up in Fairbanks that got a lot of money, and they've been talking about the same thing. You know, how can we have a museum in McGrath yeah. and uh, in every village? And, and I see that happening. So maybe when you're done with the longhouse, we'll have to see a, a museum go get built. I, I think that would be awesome for <clears throat> The people not only to get our historical values back and whatnot and sharing with the world, but I think it would act, actually create an economic value. A lot of people are really hit, interested in the Haida history. Yeah. I mean, you read about the, the Vikings of the Northwest and all his warrior stories are all about Haida. You, know. you so ruled the whole Pacific Northwest, yeah. thousand miles of coastland in the war canoes, and when, when the canoes were on the horizon and people heard the drums, <laughs> Can you imagine they that? took it very seriously. Yeah, I yeah. Mean, most of the tribes had a canoe to hold 10 people. Now you got one coming down the channel with 40 people and they're in all what matter. Whoa, I'm out of here. Yeah. I remember I read a quote by Chief Seattle asking the U.S. government to please protect them from uh, uh, Clinket Haida Simshian. Yeah. And so it was a, a powerful history. <laughs> You know, of course, of course, to send a message, you had to paddle a long way. Now you can just uh, use the internet. Yeah. So, some things have changed, but there are stories I'm going all the way to California to get the slaves and whatnot. And I was talking to an elder when I was living in Massachusetts for a little bit, and they had a story, an Ohio story. This medicine man had a vision, kept having this vision in his head, and it was a. Uh, the gal that was supposed to belong to their tribe, he was getting messages from her. So they had to paddle to go get her. So they prepared for a while. And they paddled and paddled and paddled and they went down and they went around Cape Horn. All the way down south. Went around the Horn and came halfway back up there and landed in the village. And there was a, uh, a gal there that they went in and they took her, traded for her, took her and paddled all the way back. To I don't know why they it took a long time, I guess. I would guess. But the medicine man said that she was supposed to be part of a family and it was part of a thing to be a historical thing that was making medicine, I guess, and keeping the bloodline going. But her family had gone there from generations before their hydras that had sailed around and settled over there. She was part of the family and they brought her back home. Wow. So this is, oh, I thought saying in California was a big thing, but then that story had been paddling all the way around the Cape and then halfway up the continent. Well, you know, the Polynesians and in Micronesia and in Hawaii, how'd they all get there? Yeah. Well, well so that just, uh, uh, one guy was talking, and the Maoris were talking about this and how they split off, and we believe we were part of the Polynesian group, you look at our private people, probably more, more Polynesian than the Asian. Well, maybe it's blind, I don't know. I think Haida's were all over the place. You look at the Ainu Japanese, their customs were pretty much the same. And, and there's another one that went from there, they went from there up to the Ainu and then over there. And then I started doing study history. I said, son of a gun, these people migrated to what? Over here from. And, uh, we started studying back and forth. We said, well, wait a minute. Isn't it possible that they went this way instead of coming this way? Just because these guys took history and said, but all our, our history says they went this way. 
We came in from the ocean, we come across from the Jan Bridge, we came in on a canoe. <laughs> <laughs> no way we didn't come in on a canoe. The Raven brought us. Oh, and you heard all how the Raven brought them out of the shell to hide us. Anyway, it was in the beginning of time that there lived an old chief in the longhouse like this. And with this old chief to live to hide a, his daughter, who you knows she was beautiful, I don't know, it was kind of dark. Uh, and he had a Benwood box, like one of these boxes, and in this box he had a precious item that he guarded really closely. Never let anybody have it or look at it. And uh, one day he was going to look in this box to look at his precious item, and this little mouse was under a box. He lifted the lid and the mouse was going to peek in and he shoot him away. Ah, get out of here! Eek! So the mouse got up and his feelings are hurt. He went out of the house. Long home. And he started telling everybody, what the chief has something in there, he won't let me look. He won't let me be real stingy with it. Now, the height of houses, they were seen for real tight. No cracks, it was real good cut. So the raven, he's a trickster, he's the good, he embodies everything, he's the good, the bad, the ugly, everything. He hears the story and he's very curious. So he, uh, answering him. I hear so him he, answering uh, the raven, yes. He, he gets curious and he wants to go see what the height of chief has. So he, uh, <clears throat> goes over to the longhouse and he's walking along the outside trying to find his way in because it's dark. And he can't find his way in. While he's looking around, he hears the door to open, he hears something. And the daughter is going to get a pail of water to cook and clean. So he's watching her. He bends over and gets a pail of water and brings it back in the house, closes the door. And he gets a plan. So not a raven, he's an old trickster and he can transform himself into anything he wants. Magical creature. Anyway, the next day he's waiting for the daughter to come out and get her water because he's got this plan. The ulterior motive is to get into that house and see what's in the box. So he goes upstream a little bit. When the daughter gets down to get her water, then she's going to drink some water. He turns into a pine needle and drifts down. When she bends over to drink the water, she ingests a pine needle. Now the pine needle impregnates her. It's actually the raven. Now she Grows, this happens real fast. And grows and after a while a little boy child comes out. Now this is Draven, he got in the house. But they don't know that. And our custom we call a grandfather Chinam. Grandparents generally spoil their grandchildren. Anyway, <clears throat> little Raven grows up pretty fast into a little boy and goes to the box. And Chana, can I look in the box? Oh. Wah, wah, he winds around, wah. He's trying to cry around and be no good. Trying to make the Chana get in the box. Chana looks at him and says, Now with an attitude like that, you're not going to look at my box. So he goes away and he thinks about it. Tries again, wah, no way. Tried a couple of times, not going to have nothing to do with it. All right, he went away and he thought about it and he came back and he said, Chana, may I please look and see what you have in the box? Now his attitude changed. Well, Chana likes this a little better. So he opens the box, lets his grandson look in there. Beautiful. Puts it away. A little later. Chana, may I please look at the beautiful item you have in the box? And Chana says, yeah, he's getting pretty respectful and kind about this. Yes, I will share with him. And he shared, oh, that is awesome. He's back. A while later, Chana, that is so awesome, that beautiful thing you have in the box. I sure love it. And Chana takes it out and he hands it to him, lets his grandson hold it. Grandson admires it. It's beautiful and puts it back real gently. Now he earned the trust of his Chana. The next time he asked for a Chana, he says, Okay, grandson, here you go. So he hands it to his grandson. 
Then he goes through his chore, monitoring his chore. Now the raven, he sees his opportunity. Remember, he wanted to see what was in the box. And the time we're talking about, and the time when our historical time is, the raven was white. His feathers were all white. So now he grabs a hold of his ball and he changes himself back into the raven. And he flies up to the smoke hole and he starts squeezing through. And he pops through the other side and all his beautiful white feathers are turned black. That's how the raven got to be a black color. But now he has to sing in his mouth that the chief had. And he flies out of the smoke hole and he has to sing in his mouth. And the eagle sees him and he's curious too so he flies over. Hey, what you got there, brother? And the raven, he's going to be stingy, so he opens his mouth. It's mine! It's all mine! When he opens his mouth to say that, this item falls out of his mouth. And it falls to the earth. And it breaks all up and goes up into the sky. There it was, the light, a ball of light. And one piece broke off, that's our moon. And the big piece broke off, that's our sun. And all the little pieces are the stars. That's how the raven brought life to the world. That's our story and we're sticking to it. <laughs> <laughs> now that there's light in the world, the raven is flying around. He's starting to see different things and he flies over Haida Kauai and goes over the sand spit and he sees something running around there. So he runs down, flies down to sea, they come out of this great big clamshell. And he's flying around, now that there's light, there's also shadows. So as he flies over, there's little creatures on the beach. They become very afraid when the shadow goes over them. So they run back into their house, which is a big clamshell. So he's very curious. So he uh, goes down there, there's a carving right there. And the uh, and, uh, raven grabs a hold of the shell and he pulls it open. And out come the Haida men. That's how the raven brought the Haida onto the earth. There's another version of the story, depending on who you're talking about. There was just the men. And our, our story is kind of parallel stories in the Bible that have a lot of similarity. Now, the, in the Bible, they might say it's from the river man or whatever. In our culture, in our stories, Man, he was out getting food to eat, and he was not happy. And the raven is watching him. So he's out on the beach collecting all this kelp and gumboots and abalones and one. And this abalone attached himself to the man, and he became and had a lot of sucking power. So it became very, very. Uh, he became happy. So the raven turned up. Abalone or uh, gumboot into a woman. And that's how the woman, the man came out of the clamshell and the woman was a gumboot. And that's how Haidas came out there. The raven brought them together. And that's our story and we're sticking to it. <laughs> now that we got guys in the clams and all these people running around, our raven. He uh, looks around, he's very happy with himself that he's a new tribe that he, new people that he brought to the earth. And there are many raven stories, every one of our stories probably raven connected. Now that he sees that they need more land. So he asked uh, Loon swimming around if he could go down to the bottom and get some dirt for him because Loon would dive down and bring it up. And Put it around and kept it this many times and made some diamonds for it. No, but it still wasn't quite livable. So he had to go out to this island called Forster Island because they didn't have no water. And this person owned lots of water out there, but he hid it away and he wouldn't share it with anybody. So the raven flew out there if he heard about it. And he had to sneak on the island. Made the guy take him in through deception. 
And while the guy was sleeping, he couldn't find the water because the guy would keep sneaking away when he was sleeping or get the water. So he went and got some kano or bird poop and he rubbed it on the raven while he was sleeping. And when he woke up, the raven woke up, the guy, the raven was going, ooh, ooh, Jesus, need a bath or something. He was pretty stinking, the other guy, holy smoke, I guess I do smell a little bit, maybe I'll. The raven acted like he was going to go to sleep and the guy snuck out to go take a bath and the raven followed him. And he found out where the water was. And after the guy left, he went and he scooped up lots of water and he's climbing around. And the water is falling and sort of got all these little lakes and water here and there for the water. That's how the raven brought water to our people. And the many gifts were given to us through the raven. He also was not a good guy. We can go on to the raven stories all day and all night. But usually you might have several people to interject their story. Oh, this story came at this time again. We wouldn't tell each other you were wrong. This is how I understood it. You don't tell other people they're wrong. You don't want to hurt other people's feelings. You want to maintain your brothership by not hurting each other. So there are things that we need to learn by these old stories and can take value in that. I wouldn't tell your kid. It was all out of my house pretty much to call my kids stupid or dumb. I would not let my woman say that to my kids. It was, nope, don't talk like that. You go outside. we won't be calling our kids. You got something bad to say, just keep it shut for a minute until you think about it. Try to keep positive words coming out. You know? If they do something wrong, let them know, but you don't have to beat them. That striking our children was not a native value. We didn't do that until after we learned. The Europeans came and taught us, this is how you teach. And we couldn't understand that. They had this great book of love with many valuable instructions, which are so beautiful instructions, that they talked about love and they had a stick in this hand and they beat us with a stick and they talked about love and they beat us with a stick in this hand. Wait a minute. If this is your way of love, I don't want nothing to do with it. Our people, when we talk about love, we hug the kids. We respect each other. Your idea of love scares the hell out of me to speak the truth. You tell me to fear your God? You tell me to love your God, you tell me to fear your God. I don't know, you're really messing me up here. You want to speak well, you want me to interpret these words? Just say it like it is. You want to talk about love? Let's talk about love. You want to talk about fear? Let's talk about fear. Am I supposed to say fear means love in this instance? Well, I don't know how to tell the difference. Just say it like you mean it, and I could probably live it. You know, don't play no guessing game with me. <laughs> <laughs> I love life. Yes. And I want to be here. Yes. There was a time when it wasn't always so. It got, I lost my daughter here maybe four years ago to suicide. Oh, no. So a big part of my, against drugs and alcohol, had a part to do with that part of life too. You know, I, I, you know, I lost her and I lost a lot of people, my parents, my nephew and different family members that really hurt. But my youngest daughter, she just graduated from college as a pharmacist, top in her class, a real smart, beautiful girl. I just called them up just to graduate. Go to a, my daughter's graduating and she's going to get married. A week later I'm burying her. A suicide. Now, when I could blame myself, what did I do wrong? What did I do wrong? And I think a lot of people do that. You know, what could I have said? What could I have done? Why couldn't you come to me? Still, some of these questions come to me, and you know, I'll blame myself now and then, but I try to get away from that. But we need to recognize when our people are, are hurting so bad that they're going to hurt themselves, and not just to recognize it, because I think I did, and I didn't do enough about it to stop this. I think the knowledge of this year being there, and oh, you all right? 
Yeah. It's not enough to just go talk. Do something about it. Let's go hug them. Let's go be with them. Let's go cry with them. Let's go let them tell their story. Sometimes maybe all we need to do is shut our mouth and listen. Let them talk for all. They got something to say, something to share with us. We need to stop talking and listen once in a while. We can't always be telling them what to do. Sometimes they want to share with us, but their youth does not make them dumb. Their youth is probably a lot more wisdom than we give credit to these kids for. They see a lot, they perceive, perceive a lot more than I think than we as adults do because we put up these shields to protect ourselves. They're still innocent. We need to reach into that innocence and tell them it's okay to do this. It's okay to speak either. It's okay to carve. It's okay to sing our song. It's okay to speak your mind. We shall hide no more. I'm going to shame them. <sighs> Sometimes I get, when I talk like that, I get a little emotion. Brings up something. It's the height of heart. Yeah, it brings up some things that I guess I try to get rid of it, but I'll never get rid of it. Somewhere I'll be walking and something will remind me of my daughter. I lost a daughter in a lost time. Or maybe a native uprising. I want to be there. I want to be on the bike. When they're talking about mining up here in Canada and wiping out these major streams in our country. And I got up and spoke in Ketchikan and I said, we've been practicing at this uh, uh, peaceful ways to handling with you guys, you know. And, uh, but uh, for 500 years, years now, we've been tiptoeing around, trying to do it your way. You're screwing up the lab. We might just, just say, fuck this shit and start picking up and just start blowing up your equipment. You guys are not doing it right. You guys made many, many, many promises about helping us take care of our people and our land, all our land and our people. None of those promises came true yet. For some reason, we got 80% of America believing that you're giving us these education, health, and welfare are so good for us. <laughs> I mean, that's my own fault. Again, personal traces, but if they were helping us so much, why are we looking like? I think these altered diets have a real detrimental effect on our people. A lot of these processed foods are not healthy for, for anybody. Yeah. Well, native foods are what sustained the tribe for a very long time. I, I could see it and I talked with a lot of our people that were having health problems about doing one thing, going back to our own food, especially fish and berries. I don't know why I got this thing about berries, because our people ate it on an everyday diet, you know, they all year, and ate it, blueberries, and it would dry it or whatever, and reconstituted. I was reading that health thing around the school about how their little seeds didn't, were like scrubbing bubbles. Hmm. You know, scrub out your insides and get rid of all these unnecessary things yeah. that would be happening. Well, now people are saying blueberries have antioxidants and they're discovering all these things as if it's new about the yeah. health benefits and really it's timeless knowledge. And mm -hmm. so there's another example of where we need to come back full circle and, and mm -hmm. uh, get healthy diets, get healthy again in both body and spirit. Healthy mind, spirit, body, uh, we, we just need to make those choices again. Personally, I'm on this road. People always ask me to say things or do things for them. And I say, well, I can't really. All I can do is tell you what I did for myself. Everything works different for everybody else, but this is what I did. And the main thing was to walk away from the, the, the blues. I controlled a big part of my life and made a lot of decisions for me. In fact, there's a lot of my time. <coughs> Six children and four different women. It was easy for me to walk away because I, I was just ready to go party. It didn't matter what their feelings were. Now I loved them and I took care of them, but I wasn't there for them physically. Let's talk about it. I made a good living as a youngster, you know, fishing and a lot of good jobs. You know, I made a lot of money. I sent it to their moms and bought them clothes and homes and stuff like that. But later as I grew up and I started thinking, how selfish was I? 
I could have been there as a father, but I chose to pick up the food. I could have been there as an uncle, I could have been there as whatever. But I made choices to party and hanging out with my friends. I remember when my son was getting to be a younger man. He wanted to go hunting, and it was all set up, and he was just pumped to do it. But a friend called, he had a jug. I made a choice to go drink with my friend and to go hunting with my son. I can't take those things back. I can't go back, but boy, was that a mistake. Those were some of the biggest mistakes from walking away from doing things with my children where I had the opportunity to be a positive influence. But I chose to go be part of the friend. So those moments in time are, are you can't get back. Just make the right choices. Go play up the park with your child. Go take your bigger clam down the beach. Go pick a berry. Go sit there and let them watch your car. Go sing a song. Listen to their music. Let them listen to your music. Yep. Watch a movie together. There's thousands of things. I can't understand why people say there's nothing to do. Well, I imagine youth hearing your stories, thinking about what will I look back on when I'm old? Will I have regrets? Will I be happy with my choices? Do I have the opportunity now to make choices and make a happy life so when I look back I'm, I feel fulfilled as opposed to regretful? It's, you know, share, sharing your experiences is, is invaluable. It's a way of giving people maybe a, a second chance while there's still time for their own lives. Well, I'm hoping so. For my sake, for my people's sake, for my family, all of us, and how we get along again with the world how we present ourselves to the world. And I, and I think we're getting a big facelift around here. You look at the community itself, you know, it's, it makes you want to walk a little prouder, you know, the streets are clean, the waterfront's clean. I mean, they're not very many jobs, but what there's a few is, it's, uh, and I think the new building's going to create even more work, and then the cannery's going to come up. I think the uh, more we work together on projects like that, we're going to start feeling the sense of well-being again will be reinstilled and all. Uh, Wait for that. Yeah, it's not it's all about, about money, is it? No, it's not about money at all. I'm an old, like again, I, if I had it all, I wouldn't complain if someone got offered me to buy a paddle or something. I don't know. Certainly, sell it. In fact, is I encourage it. Not our time when we try to hide some of this away. But now we want the world to know: Hey, this is us. This is what we do. We make paddles, make drums, we make canoe trips, we eat berries, we eat fish. And I've commissioned an eagle drum from you, right? Right on, brother. <laughs> we'll get on that too, yeah. Yeah. So I have my son. My son is a real good designer. I'll have him do the design. I make the drums and whatnot. He does a lot of designing. And a lot of times I've been trying to share this. Like last time I had him do a couple of designs and uh, I could do drum work. Then I had some younger people drop by and they're sitting there, oh that's nice, oh that's nice, oh I wish I could do that. Come here, sit down right here. Here's a paintbrush, here's a paint, paint my drum. So I had about three different people painting drums for me. Well, I don't want to mess it up. No, it's be fit. Just do whatever you gotta do, I encourage. I make a lot of pals and I give them to the younger people. Take it home, paint them. Or I might make it so far down and give them a piece of sandpaper so they could smooth it out. Finish it up. And finish it up. Then when somebody says, who made it? They could say, I did. A sense of feeling, a sense of accomplishment. So I'll just leave a little bit on there so they could finish it up. It's kind of a little little way of trying to sneak it in there and let them get it. So when I see a lot of young kids running around the streets with their paddles during the summer, I'm like, yeah, that's, that's good, that's good. Yeah. And I give away a lot of those drums too, especially the little guys, you know, and then I go into the house and make house make sure. So, and that's not just the wall hanging. Use it. It's a tool. It's one of our main tools. Heartbeat of the earth. Sing a song. I try to sing every day. I get up in the morning, I do my morning prayer, and the evening. You know, it wasn't always that way. Most of the time I was too much in the stupor. I wasn't uh, an 
a 911 Christian, right? When I got too hung over or too strung out on drugs, and I'm feeling really sick, please help me, and I won't do this no more. <laughs> I called on him when I needed help, but oh, well. well, I got through it on my own, you didn't show up. Forget it. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, I don't know where we're going to go from here, you know, it's all, uh, to me, I see so much positive happening with this here building and the people that are showing up and uh, the more and more youth that are involved, the singing, the dancing, I am just ecstatic to see this building coming up and have more people coming in recognition. I just seen a new uh, magazine out, Nature Conservancy. Had a bunch of stuff, the new edition had stuff on the hideouts and a lot of the wood and all our people. Yeah, there. they've had a picture of your brother on the cover and they were just here doing an interview just a little bit. That was you? Okay, I got to get a copy of that. That's me on the cover and uh, my brother's on the inside and then my son's in there too. It's kind of like a family thing. Awesome. Well, it's going to be an exciting future with stories to tell. I'm trying to learn more of the stories that. All the songs that we sing have a story with it. And I found out, I was watching some older groups, and the songs and stuff had more effect on the people out here that don't understand. You know, we could get up and sing. And it's all just noise to maybe got good rhythm or But if I stood up there and told you the story before I sang it, then you understand it, maybe you'd enjoy it more, you know. This is about. You know, this is, we're calling the spirits here to do this and that. Explain a little bit about it and why we're using it. This was used for this type of thing. So that was where I got, got myself into, started trying to talk to the older guys. And, well, how come we sing this song? What's behind it? What does it mean? So, I don't know how I got into it, really. Just asking those questions. Next thing you know, I, they got me telling the stories. <laughs> You're a wonderful storyteller. You really are. So, anyway, that's what I've been doing here the last few years. And, and, uh, I started out in Seattle actually doing apprentice work with my nephew down there. He was doing a, had a nice big home down there. He came over to visit me one evening. He's doing this Northwest Indian art for this guy. And he's sitting at my table drawing. He's doing real good work. And I said, well, I wish I could do stuff like that. I'm fishing out west, making good money. You know. Two weeks later, come back to visit me. Come on, let's go. Where are you going? Come on, let's go for a ride. Said, What's up? He said, oh, I didn't tell you. Said, What's that? He said, I signed you up for a Northwest Indian art class. And it's going on right now. So that's how I got it. To be. No kidding. So I went to class with him and I stayed in there. And learning how to do this and the guy actually had some really good stories. Steve Brown, he stayed at the Haida's out in Massachusetts, so he had some good Haida stories. Good art and whatnot. He's a real good artist. And uh, again, I was kind of upset at first having a white guy know this much and be this much better an artist and all this than me and, and our art, you know. And then after I started learning from him, seeing things from a different angle, and, Oh, I'm kind of thankful this guy took the time out of his life to get a dissertation in my when people are that interested that now we got a resource to go to. We've got books, we've got records, we've got things that you know that we have a problem. And uh, hearing the stories not having a written language, it was kind of nice to go someplace. There are all these stories and stuff are written. And maybe pretty some digital, maybe I won't have to flip a book for you now. Plug it in my hand. <laughs> <laughs> Too lazy to read. Turn the volume up. Well, these this will be on the internet, and it'll be on a website that will be mobile compatible. So it'll actually you will be able to put an earbud in your ear and turn uh, your smartphone on. Well, that's cool. Yes. And and uh, and listen to it. And uh, we're helping the kids become storytellers. And what happens now is going to be a historic story of the seventh generation in Heidelberg. I like it and I like that because each, each and every one of us have a story. 
and, and it, it would be real interesting if they could learn how to tell their own story, you know, and, and share it with us. And I remember as a youth that we weren't allowed to talk at our table or, or you know, and when there was elders around, we kept them our lunch. And, and that's one thing when I start growing up in my family, I did not do that to my kids. I would, when it was set down to feet, this was the time of conversation. Not a time to shut up. This is the time we get a very few time of the day. You're working, you're going to school, you're so we don't see each other all the time. No, we get a time to sit on the table, let's share. Let's share the love, let's share the words, let's but it was hard to break some of those things and that's only the mom and dad were supposed to come. Yeah. We kept the doors shut. Well, I, I hope to hear youthful voices making good choices and speaking to the world about Haida values. I, I, I hope to, and I, I see it happening. I could see more of the young people talking about the respect and the things and, and encouraging their buddies. Hey, don't, 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 don't. They're watching us. You know, so I think it's catching on more to the, uh, how our, our respect for each other and the world catching on. And hearing that about our, our youth that went on this trip recently, you know, cyber-based news comes back pretty fast. So hear other people come making comments like that, oh, they're so well behaved, oh, they're so... Yeah, young girls in Washington, D.C. with the powers that be and the National Council of American Indians and, and the uh, champion Basketball players having just won regionals, and the village is now busy creating a feast for tonight. And got a lot to celebrate. Just a couple, well, the regionals a couple weeks ago. Yeah. And then our elders went, older guys, my son and them, went to Canada for that all native, and they won the tournament over there. No kidding. And there's hundreds of teams go there. It is really big nationals. They come from down the state, all over Canada. And wow. Our boys went over for, our guys have won it for about 10, 15 years in a row. And we've got a small village here, but we've got a lot of good ball players. <laughs> they'll be going off to gold medal here pretty soon, and they've been winning that quite a bit. Well, I know the basketball team heads to state on Monday. Yeah. So again, I could see the pride coming back in, but still, we've got a long ways to go more with the drug and alcohol problem that, that's uh, prevalent in our, in our lot of community. Well, Alaska as a whole, we're number one in suicide. We're number one in alcoholism. We're number one in drug addiction. We're number one in domestic violence. I mean, it's good to be number one, but not in all these categories. And again, it's not just a native, it's an Alaskan. So there's no color thing there. There's natives, blacks, white. So we need again to sit down at this round table that, with a human race with common problems and find some ways to fix these problems together. You know, don't be using the skin type of thing to say, oh, you guys do this and you guys do that. Let's fix this problem at this table. Yeah, we're all better together. We're all better together, I agree. I, I, you know, I could see us sitting down, I could see more and more people looking at that, oh, geez, right, we need to quit this prejudice and it'll never go away, but we can make it better. We don't have to always think we're the best. In it. And again, using stuff like that, part of my training, they're saying, be humble, be humble, and be like this and be like this. Now, how in the world can I be humble and be a Haida? This is not working very well. I'm kidding. <laughs> I'm learning to be a proud, loud machine. No, we all got our own ways. Mine goes through a lot. I get real serious, but I always seem like I turn it into humor and try to laugh things on. Humor has power to educate. You could reach people. I think yeah. So, yeah. So, anyway, I'm sure. Uh, a lot of different things and different angles to go at, at the way I want to get my message out to the world. And it seems like I'll go back to the treatment of the uh, government and the church and their play and, and it had a real big effect on my feelings. I told you earlier about when the Pope got up and apologized. And they're going to have a meeting 
down below, I think in about six months, I just got a call from a friend and asked me if I'd be one of the speakers at this thing, and the church is going to apologize to Native America. And I've been talking about this here for years, and so they gave me a call, hey, would you show up and be your... The church is going to ask the Creator for forgiveness, huh? <laughs> He's got some really wacky guys around the way he's been treating I don't know where leaders had a prayer and says, hey, God, we would like to talk to you. We want to talk to you about your people here that are sharing your rules with us. You're being no good. Would you allow them, you talk about love and look how they're allowing them to treat us. Something's wrong. Why do you allow these people to act like that? If these are your children, they're trying to teach us why are they using that stick so freely? Why are they using the whip so freely? Why are they, you talk about love and your teaching are bringing us lots of hurt. And there are too many religions that talk about love and then their actions uh, reflect hate. Yeah. Well, again, let us be Haida. Let us all be Haida. One human be, family, yeah, huh? Let's all be brothers and sisters, yeah. And I think it's heading that direction. I believe it. And I gotta believe it. I gotta hope. You know, I have hope in my and I see it here. Our youngsters and longs we can keep on assuring them that we will back them up in their move and assure them that they are smart. They are beautiful. They could grow up to be leaders in this community, not just this community, but all over the place, any place they choose to go. They should be able to walk with their heads high.